Welcome back to this hopefully last segment on inflation. I'm going to start off talking about uh, something that is in each and every, as far as I know, uh, principles of econ macroeconomics textbook. This thing is, that I'm about to discuss is called the Fisher Equation, named after the economist who came up with this. And this is the F-I-S-H-E-R spelling of Fisher, in case you're wondering. And the Fisher equation looks something like this. There is a nominal interest rate, which means it's the stated interest rate. Uh, that is, when you get your um, uh, APR from a credit card or when you negotiate terms of uh, buying a car, the interest rate that you get on buying a car or a mortgage rate, those stated rates are the nominal interest rate. And that can be broken into parts. This is expressed as like a mathematical expression, probably to give people like me job security. But all we're saying is that that's made up of some different parts. And one way to look at it is in two parts, the way we're going to look at it. And that is the real interest rate that the lender is going to receive or anticipates receiving, um, plus some premium for anticipated inflation. So if a car loan is stated at 4% and inflation is running along at 1%, how much is the bank looking to really make on that car loan? 3%. So that's the Fisher equation and what it means. Um, and that leads us directly into a segment called the costs of inflation. So when we talk about the costs of inflation, this thing comes in handy because let's go ahead and fill in those numbers that I just suggested. The bank anticipates, and you agree to 4% on a car loan from the bank. They anticipate making 3%. That pays their bills. That's their required rate of return given their opportunity costs and their bills, and they expect inflation to run along at uh, 1%. Well, <clears throat> let's suppose that inflation turns out to be higher than expected. What if instead of 1%, this turns out to be 2%, double the anticipated rate? Now, you've already contracted to pay 4%. So what does that mean for the bank? What did they actually make? Well, I can't carry a 3 down here because 3 plus 2 doesn't equal 4. So for if reality turns out to be this, and a contract obligates them to honor this, it must be that the return they get is this. And that is bad for the bank. Now, how is that for you, the borrower? You might say, well, it's the same because you agreed to 4%. But this leads us into another thing called the inflation fallacy. The inflation fallacy goes like this. Prices are rising and my wages aren't rising, so I'm worse off. This is why inflation is bad. It's a fallacy because when things... Things might shift sometimes quickly, but when things settle, wages do rise with inflation. You might have thought it was a, a meritorious raise because you're doing such a good job, but really it might have just been a cost of living adjustment and your employer and your employer's employer wanted to pat you on the back to keep you happy and keep you going, but really it's, it's just a part of uh, inflation and your wages are rising with price level rises. And that's inflation. So if inflation has caused this one to become a two, this is what you contracted to. But for the representative person in the economy, paying 4% got easier. So this is the lender. This is the borrower. Well, if that happens, how does the lender feel about lending money at 4% again? No. In fact, next time around, 
If this is inflation, then they're going to factor in a premium of 2. And if the required rate of return is 3, now they have to charge 5. But since they got burned the first time, they might not want to, they might anticipate this is something that's going to escalate. So maybe they call it 2.5, or maybe even 3. Well, now they have to charge a higher interest rate on the nominal side, the stated rate. How do you feel about borrowing at 5.5? It's not as fun to borrow at 5.5 as it is at 4. If this begins to spiral, this is my illustration of spiraling up, then this begins to spiral up. And at some point, these nominal values, these stated values, could affect real values. It could be that spiraling higher interest rates due to higher anticipated inflation actually deters us from borrowing because the rate becomes too high. And if it changes our behavior, that affects things like employment. Because whatever we're borrowing for, in my example, a car loan, isn't going to happen as much if this occurs, if people stop borrowing because of high interest rates. That means employment, let's say on cars and the production of cars, starts to fall because of inflation. So then you have nominal variables, inflation, and stated rates affecting real variables, employment. That's people waking up in the morning with a job. And so that can happen, and that can be a real cost of inflation, is when inflation is greater than anticipated, it hurts the lenders but benefits the borrowers. Now we could play this the other way, and if inflation turns out to be uh, lower than anticipated, then it is a reverse role. It hurts the borrower but helps the lender. Uh, because the money that they're paying back has more buying power than was anticipated at the time of the original agreement. So, what we can call this is an arbitrary wealth redistribution. When, anticipation, when inflation rides along right where anticipated, I had anticipated at 1%, then everything here made sense. The, the loan was negotiated based on the bank's real return, which is a function of their costs, which is a function of the borrower's risk and things that they have determined. Um, and the borrower has agreed to pay 4%. That is, for lack of better terms, a square deal. But if this thing from outside that deal affects the borrower and the lender, inflation, somebody benefits and somebody gets hurt. That's an arbitrary wealth redistribution. And uh, that gets in the way of future negotiations because it makes success more of a chance event. So uh, hopefully I've teased out a couple of the costs of inflation by using the Fisher equation. I kind of went out of order of my notes because I went down, when I made these notes, I went down uh, inflation costs sort of down a list. But I was in the Fisher equation and I thought that would be a good way to get into that nature uh, definition of the arbitrary wealth redistribution and the effects of uh, on borrowers and lenders. So let me continue down my list of costs of inflation. And a lot of these are hyperinflation. Uh, one of them is, uh, one of these listed costs, it's in every principal's textbook, is shoe leather. Shoe leather, what's that about? Well, it's kind of like a figurative thing. Um, I spent uh, a spring break in Turkey. And uh, Turkey had had a period of hyperinflation uh, before I had been there. Hyperinflation is double-digit inflation. And that gave me the opportunity to see some of these things, two of them, when I was there. One is that changes in prices happen so frequently in an economy like that, that when you get paid today, you want to go spend that money on something real after work right away because tomorrow the buying power of that money will be less and you won't be able to buy as much with what you got paid the day before so when you get paid you have to rush out and go buy something anything that you might be able to use or that could hold its intrinsic value for you because the money isn't going to hold its value even until the next day the fact that you have to stop what you're doing this evening to run out and buy something 
that takes, you have opportunity costs, right? There are other things you could be doing with your evening other than going and buying something just to preserve the value of your pay that you got today. That's a real cost. The figure of speech is that you're wearing out your shoes, running around trying to find a place to put park your, your earnings, they, they won't lose value. Hence, wearing out the shoes, shoe leather costs. So it can be a real cost of inflation. Now that tends to be with hyperinflation more than just the kind of inflation that we're accustomed to experiencing in the United States. But it's a real cost of inflation. Another thing that I saw in Turkey, um, how they were avoiding this cost, is that what I could observe, is called menu costs. Menus, it's also a figurative use here. Menus at restaurants. Now some menus at restaurants are just paper photocopies. That's pretty cheap. But some menus at restaurants are like leather bound and really nice. And even when not at restaurants, uh, retail stores have to price their goods, right? They have, it used to be you had sticker guns, you priced them like that. Um, now, typically, they have the EPC codes, and they're programmed into computers what the price will be at that store, and then the price is identified on the shelf. Let's think about why that might be. If a price changes for a good, and you had used the old way, sticker guns, you have to take an employee and pay that person to go out there and change all the stickers or go over the stickers. That's a real cost of changing the price of a good. If you're a restaurant, going back to the paper versus leather thing, and prices are rising because of inflation, yeah, paper menus, uh, it's not too big of a deal. You just print out a new set of menus with the higher prices on. But if you have like nice leather-bound menus, that's an expense to change that menu, hence the figure of speech for menus costs. When I was in Turkey, what I saw, because of the hyperinflation that Turkey had been experiencing, was they didn't even use either of those things. They used chalkboards. Whenever you went to a store or um, uh, like a street side kind of vendor or something like that, they would have chalkboards up here. And in the morning, they would go and they would state the prices of their goods on chalk so they could just quickly erase it and change it from one day to the next. That was to avoid high menu costs because of hyperinflation. So changing those prices, now that, that's how they avoided it in some stores and where they could, but changing those prices, that's a real cost and that's a cost of inflation. So we have the arbitrary wealth redistribution, we have shoe leather costs, and we have menu costs. We could also have um, capital gains tax distortions, depending on the rules around capital gains at the time and the location, but capital gains generally work like this, the taxes on capital gains. If you buy an asset, let's say a house, like people were doing um, until 2008, people were buying houses and they were flipping them. So they would buy a house, they might go in and change the carpet, maybe change some counters or something, and have a contractor put in new countertops and the kitchens and baths and stuff like that, uh, paint, the, paint the walls and stuff like that. And in a couple of months, they would sell it for a higher price. Okay, that's a capital gain, that profit. They bought uh, something and they flipped it, and the profit margin on that's called a capital gain. It's a return on an investment, and it can happen with stocks. It can happen with assets like houses. I like that example because a number of people have probably heard of people doing that. That is what a capital gain is, and you pay taxes on that, and you might pay the same rate as your income taxes, or you might pay a higher rate called a capital gains tax rate. Uh, that varies. And some things are exempt from it. Like if you buy a house and you live in it, it doesn't, capital gains, if you lived in, I think it's for more than a year, according to federal rules, that doesn't apply in that case. So it varies. But generally, that's what a capital gain is and what a capital gains tax is about. Well, if we have inflation and you buy an asset, not particularly for the purpose of flipping it, but it really doesn't matter why you bought it, but you bought an asset at one price, there is inflation. The price of that asset is a representative of, of all goods and services in the economy it may have risen with inflation, right? Well, on paper, you've gone from this value to this value. You now have a capital gain. You have to pay a tax on that capital gain. But if the gain is really just due to inflation, you still have to write a check to your federal and state government for a tax. So what that has done is created a real tax 
on something that wasn't a real rise in price. It was just um, inflation. So it can cause tax distortions on capital gains.